I started selling drugs by the time I was 12 years old, 13 years old. When I read Jesus Hop the Atrium, I was sitting in prison when I read Jesus Hop the Atrium. guys here we go we're here thank you for tuning in we're with Eric Betancourt tremendous actor I'm going to talk a little bit about Eric uh, I met Eric doing a film we were both acting in called 1155 the reason we're talking with Eric is he is doing a Broadway show right now here in New York called Between Riverside and Crazy by Stephen Adley Gerges. Eric went up last night and made his Broadway debut. It's a huge deal for an actor uh, to make it to Broadway. It's the ultimate stage, so uh, we applaud him. So thank you for being on the show, my brother. Thank you, man. Uh, we do this for people who might be sitting at home and trying to figure out how to navigate their way, how to be inspired to. Mm. It's not necessarily for uh, about actors or sure, musicians. Sure. It, it is for people who are just trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B and what inspires you to do that. And maybe, maybe you could fuel them and help them in their life. So let's kind of brush you a little history about you, where you're from yeah. and, and your backstory. Absolutely, man. Uh, born and raised in New York City and the Bronx particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, lived there for a few years up to my teenage years where then I split time between New York City and Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. So uh, my mom left to Providence with some aunts and cousins, and that was my introduction to Providence and stuff. Wow. So, yeah. so from the Bronx. From the Bronx to that. Big difference. The big difference. Bronx big difference. in the 90s, wild place. Yeah, the Bronx in the 90s, wild place. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, you know, violence, you know, street gangs, um, drugs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how about growing up in that? Did you get mixed up in any of, of that environment, or were you able to kind of avoid that? or no yeah 100 um, percent, man like you know i grew up in the environment because it was around me my father was a heroin addict okay so uh it, it i had known about it since i was younger there was a lot of transactions happening at my at my house as a kid yeah so then knowing about it and 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 yeah i sold drugs and stuff i worked uh my way up i started with marijuana dealing to cocaine dealing to crack dealing which eventually then you know ultimately led me to be incarcerated and stuff so wow uh, so you so legal let me ask you siblings or were you no you, i got siblings yeah, 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 so got you brother. guys are you guys are growing up in this environment. And, We're all and, growing up in the environment, yeah. My mother was a, a, you know, a mother of four mom. kids, different fathers by the time she sure. was in her 30s and all that. So everyone kind of found their way. Um, I'm the one that actually went to prison. I didn't really know what was going on. And so I constantly just stayed with my mom, stayed with my dad. And, yeah. You know, and then when I figured it out and my brother and I became equals and stuff and he respected me a little bit more. So then that's when you went to... That's when I went back to New York. To New York, okay. To live with my grandmother, yeah. So most of the trouble you were getting was that in Providence? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It was it was so, the early years were in, were in Providence, and then my teenage years were in the Bronx, which eventually led me to the, my late teens back to Providence, and and, and, and then incarceration, and incarceration was was over and, there. Oh, it was over there, yeah. It was okay. In stuff, yeah. So, man, incarceration. Yeah. What was that like, man? You're young. How old are you? I was uh, 22. So wow. you know. Uh, you know, for me, you know, I started selling drugs by the time I was 12 years old, 13 years old, from selling weed to buying my first little scale and trying to figure things out, asking other people, you know, how do you break this thing down and yeah. and buying one little $20 bag to try to make a $50 profit <laughs> right. or shit. You know, right. my father was a, a dope dealer user, so he would eventually then tell me how to go about dealing and stuff. So where to hide the drugs, wow. how to keep it on my person and not, you know, yeah, reveal yeah. it and stuff. And that led me to then jump into the cocaine world and the crack game step it up and, a little yeah exactly and then opened up my whole world i then you know became an employee at a crack spot and stuff, you know? wow and, and worked with people and uh learned a little bit from that world and then went back to providence uh as a high school dropout and over there i was gonna you know try to make a, a career out of it you know yeah. make enough to get out of and, and have a better situation we grew up in the in the housing projects and stuff so although i grew up in the housing projects you know what i mean my sister grew up in the housing projects she she made some change i was just probably more influenced by the music the time period the era the the, the energy that was sure. the club scene and all that you know and and so i 
I propelled myself towards that energy and stuff. Well, it's the, right. I mean, and, and, and then as we're going to get to the success story of you, yeah. which is incredible, the arc and the change and right. talking to different people on these podcasts, what's fascinating is, you know, uh, we are products of our environment a lot of times. And, you know, you hear some people's stories and um, some have dysfunction. And uh, I myself grew up in dysfunction as well. I had a, uh, a loving family, but a lot of addiction in our household and abuse. Right. And uh, so, you know, we, we learn and survive in different ways. So you're incarcerated. Yeah. It's got to be, I mean, I don't care how tough you are. Yeah. It's a sobering feeling when those, mm. when those, those jail cells click shut. Mm. What are you going through? You're in jail. I don't know how long you were in there. It, that doesn't really matter, but yeah, if man, you want. I was 22 years old and stuff, so I had you know, started that crack career and cocaine career pretty early and then moved my way up. And yeah, getting locked up, ultimately, I had some prior charges. Uh, there were uh, misdemeanor charges, and um, those misdemeanor charges were added to this charge. You know, if you read the file, it looked very yeah, ugly, yeah. and so yeah, the they sentence, stack it. exactly, they stacked it, and the sentence was like 15 years. Right. You know, and I'm like, gee, <laughs> you know, what I mean, first time and stuff, uh, uh, going to face a felony and stuff, and it's 15 years right off the bat and stuff because of the quantity of the drugs and the other charges previous. And here I was going to face. Uh, a 15 year charge, but uh, just doing three and a half out of that 15. And wow. stuff. So I was like, you know, three and a half, and you know, maybe <laughs> something else will change from this. Yeah. I'll do that and I'm out. Expectations right. that I put on myself that I felt like, you know what, I, I, I did what I had to do and I, I did it to survive, and this is the consequences. But luckily, I'm not dead and stuff. So yeah, right. I'm going to figure a way to rise up above this. You know, on the flip side, I was scared and I was uncomfortable and, and it was a whole new environment, a whole new world, new rules. I went in there and I, and I happened to see a lot of people that I hadn't seen. Mm. So I was welcomed in a way and, yeah. and, and that felt safe and that felt comforting. My uncle's in there. And then there was other drug dealers and other people that I knew, uh, you know, for smaller crimes and violent crimes. And, and I picked up cues from guys who who were who were a little bit more uh, uh, attuned to what was happening and willing to change and stuff, you know what I mean? Because I didn't have the gang affiliations, I was able to take other jobs that somebody else who had gang affiliations couldn't and stuff, and I could move amongst the units and stuff. Right. So I did, I worked in the kitchen, you know, and, and I got my first job in the kitchen and, and learned how to cook. And then I went and got a job as a as a porter and stuff, uh, cleaning floors and, 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 uh, and, and, and that opened me up to staying productive and one kid that I was sharing the cell with, my cellmate at the time, he had left at eight, six in the morning, came back at eight, left for lunch at 11, came back after lunch and then left again. And I was like, yo, what are you doing all the time that you get to leave and come back and stuff like, and he's like, I work at the barbershop. And I was like, holy shit. And he was like, yeah, man. So I got shifts at the barbershop and I get to go to the barbershop, prep, I take a barber's class. And so I don't spend my day, and I'm sitting in the cell reading one book and stuff, you know, for eight hours and stuff. Right. And then I was like, bingo, that's what I'm doing, man. I'm gonna sign up to something to get myself up out of here and stuff, and you know, and apply myself a little bit. You know, obviously the influence was, was there to sell drugs, to, to, to be involved in the inner prison world in a lot of ways. Um, but I avoided it, man, and uh, stayed neutral and just applied myself to what was, what was offered and stuff. There's a moment right there where, where you see somebody is being productive in a way. Now, it may be like, how are you getting out of the cell? Right. But you're seeing someone's doing something that you want to do. Right. In civilian world, it could be somebody just bought a new Tesla. Somebody right. just got a, a new house. You're like, man, I'm trying how to get those things. Right. How are you doing that? Right. That's what you know. How are you doing this? Exactly. Yo, you asked. Right. He, exactly. told, he told. And then you, and then you made the a steps. decision. Right. That's so important. 100%, man. And I think that was the difference from the drug game, right? Because I was on the outside watching and I wasn't getting advice. So I took a lot of, you know, reckless you know, situations that I put myself in and a lot of risk. This other world, my man got a trade. He was working in the barbershop. He was, he was, he was putting himself to, to, uh, to, a, to a creative, healthy lifestyle it, uh, overall within the circumstance of what we were living in. Right. And it was working for him, man. And he told me exactly how to sign up. He told me how to do it. And, and I, that to me was like, I don't need anybody on my back. I don't owe anybody anything. I just mind my business, apply myself, 
punch in, punch out, and I'm good. I'll be all right. Work ethic. I, 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 right, a work, work ethic. ethic right, is, I mean, you had it on the street. You, you didn't know it at the time. But you though, didn't right? know it, exactly. right? You it was a, it time, it's, right. e, but you had it. And that's why I love the cultural things. You know, I watch documentaries, mobsters, gangland, stuff like this, because there's something about the hustler right. that, that, you know, you take, you take somebody that, that they're creative, they know how to make something out of nothing, right. and it's the environment sometimes, right? Yeah. You had the hustle, and the intelligence is there, you see yeah. it, and now work ethic gets instilled. Right. And I think that's also how then, fast forward, I get out of there after two years. You know, luckily, two years because I applied myself. I took the programs. I did the, mm. you know, I did the AA meetings. I did the self, you know, evaluation, internal work, and stuff like that. And uh, I was able to get some education help and stuff. My first college courses were in prison, oh, wow. and, and GED as well. I was able to help other guys get their GED while I was learning it myself. Wow. You know I mean? That set me up because then that work ethic started to show itself in other areas. Um, and I just want to say it was that that also landed me to be an actor because my father not only glamorized the street world in terms of the drug world, but he glamorized it on television and on screen. Okay. So those guys, those Gaudis, those right. know, Frank the, Lucas, the Corleones, the Corleone, and the Godfathers, and, then it leads and the, to the Godfathers, sure, and it leads to the same, same. And stuff, right? So, so my father's we're raised with them. this already, exactly, right? So I was six and eight and ten <laughs> years old watching these movies. I'm, I'm watching Scarface, <laughs> Scarface at eight years old, right? And yeah. I'm watching Godfather. I, you know, my father buys me a, a collection of the Godfather Part <laughs> One and Part Two, and I'm only eleven. Right. He takes me to see Godfather. <laughs> part three and I'm 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 12 years old you know same I mean? yeah that's and so great. that those two things were influences for me because I saw what my father saw and what he admired and I was like hey you know and not that I knew it at the time but right. you know now I could actually speak on it or whatever but before I didn't know it at the time and, and then that led with some other things that happened or whatever that led to me potentially being an actor and stuff you know? wow so yeah let's jump in there so 24 years old. 24, time. and you jump right into deciding to be an actor? Or you No, no. So uh, uh, at the time I get out, I, you know, I got to figure out my living situation. I got an ankle bracelet. I got to wear that for nine months. Um, I got to get a job. Uh, I, I, I did eventually learn how to cut hair in prison. So that was a couple trades I picked up. I, I, I learned how to weld. I, know, I learned how to cut hair. Nice. And I learned how to cook. Uh, you know, so I took these skills and I applied myself. I was a welder for a company outside of prison. And okay. Stuff. In the process of that, uh, these jobs that I was getting were laying people off. And so I was under the impression that I was going to leave prison with the same job that I got in the work release program and I was going to be able to follow it outside of prison. Right. And so when I went up to the boss and I was like, hey, I was wondering if I could get a full time position here because I'm leaving prison now permanently. I'll just be wearing the, the bracelet for the next nine months. He was like, um, by the way, I was going to tell you I'm going to let you go. I lost the job. I, I, okay. you know, unemployed. And then I'm scratching my head because now I got probation and parole telling me, you know, what are you doing? You need a job. It's that you fine a... line. Do I go back to hustling? Do I go back do to I... hustling? Do, you know, do I go back to what I know? And, and and I tried this and you told me this would work, but it necessarily, you know, not, not adding up and stuff. So in the process, I got discouraged. But luckily, uh, my brother was uh, in pursuit of getting his degree as an actor. So my brother now is an actor and he says, why don't you try acting classes and all that? And I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot someday, but I need to make money. I need to survive. I need to get a life or whatever. And so he would always give me plays. He would always, you know, talk to me about theater, talk to me about the movies we watch. My nephew is named after a, a character in the movie. I'm named after a character in the movie. Really? My name is Eric and is after Eric Estrada from the oh. TV show Chips. <laughs> oh, wow. And my, my brother's Rocky. Named after, after Stallone nice. Boboa, right? Nice. And my nephew is named after another character. Oh, your dad really so, was a movie fan. So I love that. Big, man. So, <laughs> so I was working as a youth advocate, helping young kids get their GEDs and get their uh, license and get nice. you know, meeting with job potential um, for this organization. 
And that was me after prison, um, you know, trying to give back to the community and help out and stuff because I, I didn't have a job at that point and I was looking for this organization to hire me as a caseworker and stuff. And I brought this young kid to an audition and he, he had gang problems and an affiliation. So he's like, can you drive me to this audition interview? And then, you know, I, 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 I'll see you later. We'll talk some other time. I was like, no problem. When I get there, he's like, can you come upstairs with me and like, you know, can you wait? Because then if I take the bus or I drive, if I walk home, I might get shot or I might get killed. So I was like, I was like, all right. So I go upstairs and when I get there, the door opens and it's a guy who I was in prison with who had served over 15 years and stuff. So he was in there. I met him in there in the library. And when that door opened, it was him, and we made eye contact, and he was like, yo, E, what's up? I was like, yo, he what's He was up? the casting director? He, he was the oh. writer of the play. Oh, He's wow. in the room with the casting wow. people. And he's the writer of the play. He's like, yo, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm bringing this guy, because he said he had an interview, <laughs> and so I'm helping him, and I got to get home. And he's like, yo, why don't you audition for my project? And I was like, nah, like, I don't act, man. I'm not like that. And, and you know, it's not in me at this point. I, you know, I don't know if I'll be all right in that. And then he's like, it's just like what we were doing in prison. The story takes place in prison. The play <laughs> takes place in prison. Uh, you, you'll he's be like, the guy. yo, it's written off us. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, that's what he's saying. Wow. You, you'll be the guy who, who plays chess, and you'll be the guy who sometimes has these great monologues. And that's what I used to do. I used to play chess. I used to play backgammon. You know, wow. I was always playing spades. And, you know, so yeah. I was always entertained by the card games instead of watching the television most of the time. And so I was, I'll give it a shot, man. And, you know, I'm reading off this thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do the best that I can. And he gives me the job. <laughs> And I go to my parole officer and I'm like, hey, look, I don't know what I'm doing for employment right now, but I'm in a show and stuff in a play and I'm trying to commit myself to this thing. Um, and uh, I'm going to sign up to college. At least that gave me some time to figure out what I was going to do. And I wasn't going to get uh, violated for not having employment. So then at that point and stuff, uh, my brother says I should do it. I commit to it. I do it. And then I, I kind of fall in love with it, man. And I fell in love with it in the sense that it was a community of people who necessarily who weren't nobody was famous or nothing like that but everyone loved acting and they loved the camaraderie and they loved the you know the togetherness and they embraced me and here I am the writer is also a, a, an ex-felon I'm an ex-felon the n other actors are not right there's some other people that are really hard-working community actors and there were some other people who were new and we all just congealed and like you know every night painted a new piece cut a new piece of wood put it up to the best of our abilities, got standing ovations, became friends, you know, continued to, you know, hang out and talk to each other. And uh, one thing led to the next. I loved it. I signed up to a couple community college classes. Um, and one of them was introduction to acting. And then that just rolled and rolled and rolled. Um, I then finished the community college and I applied to uh, an undergraduate program and I get accepted into the end undergraduate program. One of the women who was in that play with me is like, oh, I live 10 minutes away from that college. So if you want to go to that college, why don't you live in my house? Me and my husband live upstairs. You could live downstairs in the lower half. It was a ranch style house. Wow. And just pay us rent and stuff. And I was like, bingo i leave wow. the city you know and i'm staying outside of the campus just 10 minutes away and the whole environment the world changed you know we're talking green grass we're simplicity, talking about simplicity peace. right a work ethic a, you know a daily daily structure the gym the school you know classes home you know and it was just routine after routine and that really grounded me i did that for three years i graduated with honors and magna cum laude and all these great accomplishments because I really you know dedicated myself but also uh, I was an older student so you know I mean that was my uh, way to catch up and play and play catch up but my way of like I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this for real and I'm gonna yeah. commit to it I already you know uh, dove in head first um, and I applied to graduate schools after that the one I got into was the world-famous actor Actors studio so, yeah. incredible so that that joined a long legacy of, of exactly huge and then Right, the full circle then, I'm meeting and I'm talking and learning from the same people that my father used to watch in these movies and right. tell me, that's a bad actor right there, that's an amazing actor wow. right there, you know, like, 
wow. he, the people he glamorized, I'm now in that circle. Do it, I do feel it like, meeting. Exactly. I feel like hopefully my relationship with him has evolved and stuff. And he sees me in a light and stuff where, you know, I was looking for that guidance and that leadership and it wasn't there at the time for his addiction and stuff. And, uh, and my mother's uh, uh, issues and, and, you know, uh, her personal things and stuff. So... I felt finally validated, man, that I was like, man, I'm at the place where, you know, uh, my, my, my family could be proud of and stuff, man. And it was great. And I took it personal and, and committed to it and graduated and, and completed the course and stuff. Man, not, you know, I've been knowing you for a while. Not till sitting here talking to you did I know how much, um, you know, I could relate to you and, and hearing your story. And I know many other people are going to feel that, you know, um, just finding that simplicity in life, finding the theater, the black box, the cool air right. of the black box, and, and the, uh, the surroundings being gone, you know, um, that negativity and just being able to breathe. Right. And that's important, I think, in life for all people. Um, sometimes when the, the chaos, it, it, no matter what walks of life you're from, it's just bringing it down. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just being able to find a focus and chase it. Like you're currently in a play right. by today's, I'd say, Stephen Adley Garrigus is, it was the writer that when I was in that black box mm -hmm. and I didn't know, and we, there was Shakespeare and there were these, these plays in, right. in this community college, I was taking an acting class nice. and um, it was a Stephen Adley, it was Jesus Hops A train that was handed to me. Like, That's yo, the man, same one for me. Same right. for me. Just same some for guy me. in class was like, yo, you should read this. This right. dude's from New York. You might, and it was Stephen's work that made me go, yo, there's a place for me in theater. 100%. So, wow. I'm glad you so said that. So sitting here with you is full you circle, that. man. So it's amazing, the right. synergy right. you right. just yeah. threw. It really wow. mind boggles. So today, yeah. to close out, you are in a play yep. by our Shakespeare of our time, exactly. Stephen Adler. He's an incredible right. writer. You are bringing his words that this genius puts on paper. You being a genius actor are bringing those words right. to life. What a tremendous journey, man, for people listening right. from the streets and hustling and prison and right. learning. And now today, you're on the biggest stage in the world, Broadway, right here yeah, in man. New York City. It's the biggest mountain to climb, I think, for me professionally, because it's Broadway. And that's, you know, ultimate, the highest, you know, peak that I wanted to accomplish and stuff. And uh, ma many, many people who have New York City dreams and stuff, you know what I mean? So, and it's with Stephen Alley Gerges' work. I mean, the guy who, when I read Jesus Hop the Atrium, I was sitting in prison when I read Jesus Hop the Atrium. Yesterday, by the way, was my first performance on Broadway, Broadway debut, you man. know? So it was just amazing, man, to go out there and uh, and put my heart on the stage and stuff. So, you know, my brother, keep doing what you're doing. The world needs it. Your story needs to be. I, I hope we could do a part two, man. I think a lot of the viewers right. that will view this are going to relate to this story. Mm. And um, if I'm relating, so are there out there, man. Your story is incredible. You you belong here. Okay. God's got you here for a reason, man. Keep for doing sure. it. Keep. Uh, we didn't even get into like his day job hustling <laughs> right, and right, working. Exactly. And it's thing. not all just glamour nah, and glitz. This, this man story. works hard. Uh, he manages a restaurant right. here in New York. It's not it, it, the working actor, man. Is right. a lot of work. But you know, there's gonna be a part two on this one for sure. Right. Eric, I know you gotta go, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. All love, man. Thank so you for coming you. here, man. Pleasure, man. Congratulations on everything, Thank you, man. man. Thank you. Uh, big fan. Thank you, guys. You. Remember, it doesn't matter where you're at, what you're doing. I really hope, I'm not trying to be on a big soapbox, man. I hope this story really hits somebody out there. It doesn't matter where you're at, man, what you're going through. Other people have been there, man. You're not alone. There's inspiration to find in everyone. Find your village. Find the people who lift you up. That's the right. most important thing you got. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's not. Right. Sometimes it's just somebody that has no blood relation. That's Find them. I pray for you all, man. Let's keep going. You should never stress about the problems you be facing. Everybody in the mud on the struggle trying to make it. Look into the mirror and you see your motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration. I'm finding inspiration. And once I get a hold of it, I'll never get complacent. Look into the mirror and you see the motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration.